Hey everyone. Uh, so I was studying Beijing um, and in the morning we'd have lectures and in the afternoon we'd have clinics. And one of the days, uh, one of the lecturers couldn't come in to, to teach us uh, for some reason. So they were scurrying around looking for someone to replace him. And they found this guy uh, walked in and it turned out that he was an acupuncture researcher. So uh, usually every day we'd have uh, an acupuncture uh, lecturer come in and go through the, the course material in the book and have slides or whatever like this. Uh, but this guy came in just with nothing, just with a pen, um, kind of pushed up onto, onto the stage uh, teaching these foreign students. Um, so he, he, he came out and he was like really like a total typical lab rat kind of guy, you know, hair in the face and a little bit shy and little glasses kind of going, okay. And uh, he said to us, would you like to know what is the nature of the channels? And we looked at each other and we were like, yeah, yeah, we want to know, <laughs> definitely, because we do, right? We want to know uh, what, what are the channels? Uh, there's a lot of debate about what the channels are. And I think in one of the previous lectures I gave here, uh, somebody asked me, so, you know, what's the news <laughs> on what the channels are? So uh, that's what this uh, part of the, the course is about. Um, since then, uh, I didn't realize at the time that I was going to end up just like him, uh, a lab rat, <laughs> down in the basement of a, of a physiology building with my head in a microscope looking at neurons and trying to figure out uh, how the brain works. So he, he gave us this lecture, a uh, couple of hours lecture, and it was absolutely astounding. We were amazed at the stuff he was telling us. But most of it was completely over our heads. And the reason is that he was using a very scientific language. Um, it wasn't, he was speaking in English and his English was okay, but uh, most of it was just really over our heads. So like, for instance, he, he, he said at one stage, he said, you know, GABA, GABA. And we were looking at each other like, GABA, like what? He said, you know this, you know this, GABA. And he wrote on the board in capitals, G-A-B-A. And once I went to university and learned about the ner nervous system, I realized that's what this guy was talking about, gamma aminobutyric acid, which is a common neurotransmitter. It's a chemical in the body that helps your, your neurons uh, communicate. So when I went to China to find out what are the channels, what I found is that what they're looking at is the nervous system. They're looking at the brain. They're looking at how neurons uh, communicate with each other uh, to see uh, how it, how it uh, all fits together. So uh, the second part, oops, the second part of the course is all about this. It's all about, um, the first part is on the, the vessels, so the actual acupuncture channels, the channel system, and what it is, the vessels, the meridians, the channels. The second uh, part is called rivers and trees. So uh, it's called trees because uh, in Western science, we talk about the heart and the vasculature as the vascular tree, we call it a tree, because of the structure. It branches and branches and branches like a tree. But the thing about that uh, image of a tree is it's kind of static. It doesn't really communicate with its surroundings. Compared to the Chinese description of the channels is a system of rivers. And a river, unlike a tree, rivers will feed the environment around them and will be fed by the environment. They, they swell, they shrink as the weather changes. This is the way they think about uh, the, the channel system. Ours is a little bit more static and structural. That's the way Westerners think. So in the course, I bring these two ideas together to bring a, a, a more whole uh, picture of, of what the channel system is. Uh, it's also all about blood flow, how blood flows in the, in the body, how the body is able to call blood to different areas. And that's really key for how acupuncture works. It's about diverting blood flow. So the, the next part is uh, called the acupoints, because I always wanted to know um, what makes an acupoint an acupoint? and not just 
random place on the body. What, what, what defines an acupoint? And I had been wondering and asking a lot of other researchers, like, can we come up with a list of criteria for what makes an acupoint? Are there universal properties of the acupoints? So I found through my research some answers to, to those questions. Um, the, the last part is about needling. So I wanted, to, I wanted to add this part to the course because uh, I found through my practice and through looking at the research, um, sometimes, well often actually, a client will come to me and I always ask everyone, have you had acupuncture before or not? And when they say they have, uh, I'm like, okay, great. So you know what it feels like. And often uh, they're, they're lying down and I give them acupuncture and I get the ditchy sensation, I like to get a strong sensation. Because the stronger the sensation, the stronger the effect. That's what the Chinese say. And I get the needling sensation and the client goes, oh, what's that? And I think, hmm, has this person really had acupuncture before? Or did they have maybe weak acupuncture? Was it very powerful? I don't think so. Because in the research, it says that strong needling sensation will give a strong effect. So I am going to devote a, a little section of the course to uh, needle technique um, and also the importance of de qi and what de qi is. So when someone gets a sensation, what's happening to them? Because that's the other thing that the uh, client will say, once I get the de qi sensation and they go, whoa, what's that? Then I want to answer them exactly what that is. So these are the questions that I started off with. Uh, I wanted to know, what are the acupuncture channels and the acupoints? How can we measure them? Can we measure them? What research has been done? What do the original developers of acupuncture say about the channels and the points? So the people who invented acupuncture, what do they call them? What do they say that they are? So I, I, I read a really amazing book by this guy, uh, Robert Becker. I don't know if you've heard of this book. It's called uh, The Body Electric. Um, and uh, he found, he did some research with uh, his PhD student to look at the electrical activity around uh, the acupoints. He, he did a lot of work on uh, bioelectricity and looking at... Um, how we can heal naturally. He was looking at how uh, salamanders, if, they, if, if you chop off a leg of a salamander, it will grow back uh, completely in, intact. So he was looking at the electrical activity of how that happens, how the nervous system can regrow and why ours don't, you know, if you chop off your arm, that's it, it's gone. Um, so he was looking at, he decided to investigate acupuncture and the National Institutes of Health uh, gave him funding for this. Um, and him and Maria Reichmanis, uh, his student, they invented a little wheel, like a pizza cutter, that rolls along the skin and tests the electrical, uh, what they call conductance, like how well the current flows. And they rolled it back and forth along around uh, acupuncture points. And this is one. This is LI4, this point here. And you can see it's like, it looks quite convincing that that's, that looks like there's something there. It's like a topographical map where uh, at the center, uh, electricity or electric current can flow uh, very fast. Um, so he did that in 1979 and, and I read that book and I thought, you know, someone must have done it better by now. Uh, so I had a look and um, I found uh, Gerhard Litzer, uh, who is now my, my colleague in, in publishing, he did this in 2011, and um, he used a little black box that you put on the skin, and there's rows of little metal electrodes touching the skin, and uh, that picks up the electrical activity at the, at the surface of the skin. And this is what he found uh, for one of the acupuncture points, that at the acupuncture point, the uh, resistance to, to electric flow is, is lower. 
than at a normal point. Now, you don't need to know about electricity or resistance or conductance or any of those things, but you can see that there's a significant difference between an accu point and a non-accu point. So I thought, okay, yeah, maybe there's something there. Um, and then recently, uh, this is another uh, attempt at, at finding out what the accu points are and if they exist. Um, this was a, a big team of people from around the world, um, led by this guy Brian Gao, but from all over the world, integrative medicine centers, uh, super high tech, uh, what is this, a non-contact scanning Kelvin probe. And um, so what that is that I had never heard of, but uh, it was, um, it's, a, it's a, a device that is held up close to the skin, but doesn't touch it. Because with, with these other uh, techniques, you have to touch the skin. And the problem with electricity on the skin is if the skin is in any way damp, or even if the air is moisture in the air, it will completely change the results. So you can't, um, you can't compare studies around the world in different places. So these guys did a non-contact, you just hold the probe close to the skin, read the electrical activity. So on the, on the top left there, uh, that's Li4 on one person. And just immediately looking at the picture, you don't know, need to know how it's made or what any electric potential means or anything. But you just look at the picture and it's like, hmm, that looks like an acupoint, right? Um, and then on the right, that's a control point. So it's meant to be a non-acupoint. But guess what? It looks kind of like an acupoint, doesn't it? It looks like the one on the left. So, hmm, problem. Uh, then on the bottom, it's also Li4, a different person, the left. It looks like an acupoint, maybe. Uh, on the right, uh, not so much. Uh, so, I don't know, not very convincing. Uh, this is another point they tried, the uh, PC6. So, you see on one person is the top, and another person on the bottom. So, on the top left, looks like an acupoint, maybe. On the other side, I don't know, it looks a little similar. Uh, on the bottom, it doesn't look anything like a point at all. And on the other side, I don't know, you know. So, um, yeah, like statistically, these are the same. Um, so not, not particularly conclusive, eh? It's not like acupoint definite red center thing and non-acupoint completely, you know. It's, so I don't know if that really works, you know. So we, we have all these surface measurements, you know, with, with these incredibly complex words that no one has ever heard of unless you're an electrician or a physicist. You know, equiconductance, impedance, electrical potential. So can anyone see a kind of problem with this line of questioning? Well, the first thing I can see is surface. It's on the surface. And where are the acupoints? I mean, when you give acupuncture, where do you put the, the, the needle? Uh, how, how many sizes of needles do we have? Are all our sizes of needles this, this size mm -hmm. to reach the surface? No, we have needles this size, this size, this size, because they're, they're deep, aren't they? The acupoints are deep, they're not at the surface. So that's one problem. And the other problem that I see with this is that the inventors of acupuncture didn't know anything about this and didn't have access to any of this technology. So. I, I kind of feel that the acupoints, to answer the question, what are the acupoints? I feel that it's something more obvious than all this kind of complex machinery and, and conceptualization and testing equipment. It's got to be something a little different. So I asked, like, what is under the surface? What structures and processes are causing the changes measured at the surface of the skin. What's going on underneath? And, you know, there's a great way of finding out what's underneath. You can dissect, you can dissect. And that's what uh, the Chinese did. Um, I, this is a quote from the Book of Han. I think I've showed it to you guys before, but it's a really great quote. Um, it was written, I don't know, ballpark 300 BC 
and it is the first in the world uh, written recording of a, a human dissection. The imperial physician, a master herbalist, and a skillful butcher, together disemboweled and flayed him, measuring his five organs, and with fine bamboo poles, the length of his blood vessels, to know where they begin and end, so that a person can use this knowledge to heal illness. So I, I feel that, that just as I asked, you know, what's under the surface, they asked what's under the surface too, and they looked. They looked under the surface. So here's a hypothesis that is going around at the moment uh, that I found out about and that I am also following. Acupuncture channels and points are based on physical structures directly observed by dissection of cadavers. So I'll show you some, some work that people have been doing that uh, really opened my eyes to a whole new way of looking at this problem. But firstly, uh, the Neijing, the Yellow Emperor's internal classic. What did the inventors of acupuncture say? So the 12 conduit vessels. Now, conduit vessels is a translation from um, uh, Paul Unschuld, 2016. He's a German professor. I really like his, uh, his translation. It's really clear for Westerners. But he calls the, um, the meridians, or the channels, conduit vessels. That's how he translates the, the, the Neijing. So the 12 conduit vessels extend hidden in the partings of the flesh. They are in the depth and cannot be seen. So it's not that they're invisible, it's that they're hidden in the depth. That's where they normally cannot be seen. Where they normally can be seen, so normally they can be seen, that is where the foot major yin conduit crosses the exterior knuckle. So you're talking about down here on the ankle. Because there is nothing where they could hide. So in this area where there's not much flesh, you can see from the outside the vessel. Those vessels that are always visible at the surface, they are all the network vessels. So look, what is, what is visible at the surface? Your veins, yeah. They originate from between the five fingers, ascend into the elbow, where they unite. So the things that you can see that ascend up to the elbow and that can't go through is all the blood vessels come together and they gather into big neurovascular bundles and then those big bundles go through the joints. So it's true that like the big vessels, they come down and then they, they start branching out um, down here. Here's another quote. The conduit vessels are usually not visible. Whether they are in a condition of depletion or repletion or excess and deficiency, that can be known from the movement of the chi at the chi openings. So the chi openings is the the carotid pulse point and the radial point, pulse point. They talk about these these chi openings all the way through the the book. So when you when you feel the this movement at at this uh, pulse point, what are we feeling? We're feeling the blood vessel and the, the energy of the heart, uh, the force of, of the heart, the force of our bodies uh, in our uh, blood vessels. All the vessels that can be seen are the network vessels. Network vessels are unable to pass through the large joints, like I said before. They must follow an interrupted path by leaving and entering the longitudinal conduits merging in the skin again. Where they meet the skin, they can always be seen from the outside. So they were talking about, you can see these things. You can see these things, um, unless they're hidden under the flesh. And in that case, you'd have to dissect. So I should have given you a warning. <laughs> it's a big uh, photograph of a, of a dissection. Um, so uh, uh, a lady called Vivian Shaw, um, did a very good uh, paper uh, looking at, she did, she dissected um, about six bodies, I think, uh, to 
look to, she dissected th these bodies just using the technology that the people who wrote the Neijing would have. So not using any microscopes or anything, just, you know, scalpel and uh, whatever else. So she looked at uh, each of the points and she took the names of the, the, the points and saw if the name of the point made more sense looking at the, 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 the topology, like what was going on around the point. So um, in, she's, she's marked out uh, LI5, the, the anatomical snuff box here, and it's called uh, Mountain Stream or, or Yang Ravine, a ravine. And you can see the radial artery is kind of like flowing down this little hill here, uh, like a mountain stream. And this word uh, ravine, the, the Xi, the Yang Xi uh, word there, ravine, um, it pops up again and again uh, for lots of different uh, uh, points that also look like um, two raised areas and then a vessel in the middle, like a river in the middle of a ravine. Um, she has a, a whole paper with tables and I've done tables of um, of these names of points and the anatomical landmarks that are around those points. Um, here's another one. So, so this is this is the point in here. You can see there's a hole there. Um, the name of this point, stomach 39, sorry, stomach 29, is Ravine Hole or Ravine Valley. And you can see uh, this is the epigastric vessels. So vessels running down from the stomach uh, down into this point. Um, she says, a dissection of the abdomen of a embalmed cadaver at Ravine Hole shows inferior epigastric vessels running between the two bellies of the rectus abdominis. So that's along here and this here. This is the belly button. Can you understand what this is here that we're looking at? This is the belly button that's kind of been cut around and the two uh, flanks of the belly have been, the muscles have been taken off. And then this is the leg. This is the groin here. So it's, it's like around here. But you can see you know, your, your stomach channel coming down here is the epigastric vessels running along here. They appear as tributaries, which join together to form larger vessels descending into the abdomen to form an anastomosis. An anastomosis is like a bridge. Uh, you've got two blood vessels, and then there's a bridge in between. A lot of acupuncture points I have found are located at these bridge points, which comes in very, very important when we start talking about the mechanisms, it's, this stuff gets fascinating at this point. So in case that that wasn't uh, very intriguing, um, has anyone heard of Pony Chang? He's, uh, he's a Chinese uh, researcher, acupuncturist who works in Canada. Um, and he has some really, really great stuff online that I would, I would recommend anybody uh, search him. But he is doing uh, dissections similar to this. He's doing dissections as they would have been done by the writers of the Neijing. And uh, he is a proponent of the, ac the channels and the acupoints being uh, physical um, structures like nerves and blood vessels. And uh, he, he thinks that, that about a third of the points have drifted from where they were meant to be originally, but if we look at the names of the points and we look at the structures underneath, um, it starts uh, looking very interesting. So, um, so I have a, a picture of the head here and all the, the nerves of the face and head. And I got all this information from, from a lecture that Pony Chang did, so I just want to give him uh, credit. Um, but I wanted to make a nice visual for all the information he gave because it's just uh, really, really great. So um, I'll start with this one here. You know this point? So it's the top one, bladder one, is at this little, uh, this little uh, branch point. It's actually the color's not great on that slide, but can you see the little, little nerve branch there? 
Yeah. And then if we go to, I think, this one here, bladder two. Can you find bladder two? Is that this point here? Can you see what's there? There? It's a little nerve branch. And uh, Yu Yao, where's Yu Yao? Extra point, middle of the eyebrow. So what have we got? Uh, the, the supraorbital, supraorbital nerve. And then uh, Sanjiao 23, the lacrimal nerve at the end of the eyebrow. Uh, tai Yang, this is kind of, it's not really positioned very well on this diagram because Tai Yang is kind of out here, isn't it? But it looks like it's a bit up there. I think that's just the diagram. But uh, yeah, that's uh, another uh, nerve associated to the zygomaticotemporal nerve. Um, GB1, he thinks, is, uh, it's called pupil crevice. Um, now, GB1 is, is, is out here, usually we, we put it. He thinks it has drifted from this point at the branch of that, sorry, where am I? Of the zygomaticofacial nerve. And then the last one, my favorite, uh, stomach two. Where, where is stomach two? You measure it down here, yeah, great. Yeah, you, you use the pupil, like that, and we go down. Uh, the name of it, uh, syllabi is four whites. Like you look at the surface of the skin, four whites. What does that mean? It's cryptic, you know. It just, you think, well, what could that possibly have originally meant? <laughs> you look at this. One, two, three, four. Nerves are white. When you, when you take them out, and they're, they're white color because they're covered in fat. These four, four little vessels, they actually counted. And a, a lovely part of what Pony Chang was, was uh, presenting when, when I listened to this is um, he showed a picture from Grey's Anatomy. Do you know the book Grey's Anatomy? Yeah, yeah, our, it's our like foundational anatomy text. And actually in an earlier edition of Grey's Anatomy, they had three nerves coming out. And in the latest version, they have uh, four. So these guys who wrote the Neijing actually got it better than Grey's Anatomy. Um, Pretty impressive. So, you know, you can you can you can take it or leave it, but uh, you know, how does it all fit together? What do we do with this information? You know, the, as soon as I learned all this, I thought, well, what about the acupuncture channels that we've learned about? How can the channels, as we have learned about them, match up with the neuro neurovasculature that we know about? if that's what they're saying, that the neurovasculature is the, is the, the channels. Um, what do we do? Do we call Alex Gray and say, you know, your paintings are wrong? Um, I mean, in, in China, it's a little bit of a non-problem. Um, the Chinese, they don't really uh, argue over things um, and they never contradict their parents or their ancestors or anyone who went before this. They don't contradict, you know. Whereas in the West, we argue and argue and argue until we find the truth. You know, it's a totally opposite um, strategy. Uh, but one day I was in a clinic uh, with a, a, a colleague um, and the doctor was teaching us acupuncture and was saying, oh, the nerves this and stimulate the nerve that and nerves, nerves, nerves. And my colleague said, what about the meridians? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, the meridians, the meridians. And we looked at each other like, well, what does that mean? I mean, they're using nerves and meridians interchangeably. That's not something that we heard here in the West ever. Uh, we, you know, we were told that they're strictly different um, systems. And all of the researchers that I have found uh, are doing these surface measurements because we are, we have been told and we, leave the, the, the books that it's these lines on the on the surface you know it's not um, it's a different system that doesn't link in so um, yeah it's a, it's a bit of it's a bit of work uh, it's a bit of um, well, we'll have to feel it out but I would like people to come with me um, 
on the on the journey of, of figuring that out and seeing what we can do to make it fit together. Uh, and I think we can absolutely fit, fit it together. And people like Pony Chang, like Dr. Edward Neal, um, they are fitting it together really, really well um, and in, a, in, a, in a beautiful way that doesn't compromise what we've already learned. And even Pony Chang says, um, we don't need to learn a different system or, or stop using um, uh, the points as we have been using them. Um, so, uh, yeah, what I, my conclusion out of, out of all that information is that the acupuncture channel system is not separate to the neurovascular vessels, but maybe a different way of looking at how the transport vessels of the body connect the organs uh, to the periphery. It's definitely, it is definitely a different way of looking at the nervous system and the blood vessels. And that's what I found through my research, that it's actually a, a, an incredible way of looking at how uh, nerves and blood vessels communicate, how blood flows in the body, how, how we can um, alter blood flow by stimulating nerves at the at the periphery, how we can trick the brain into thinking that uh, something is going on in the organs when actually it's happening out here. Um, so uh, I haven't done away with uh, any of the Chinese teaching that I've gotten. Actually, it's really, really informed uh, my research. And my, my main reason for wanting to do this, my desire for finding out this information is um, because I, I, I recently had an had a, uh, experience where I had a problem. I went to my GP and she uh, referred me to a, a physio. And I called the physio. I did what I was told to do what the doctor tells you. I called the physio and I booked an appointment. Six weeks was the fastest I could get an appointment, six weeks. And I went to the physio, and it was in a beautiful uh, big building with 10 treatment rooms, all physiotherapists, all booked out for six weeks. I got a great treatment from her. It was twice the price of what I charge my clients uh, for the same amount of time, and a similar level of ther therapeutic exchange. And I just thought, you know, how come we don't have uh, six week long waiting lists for a similar level of therapeutic exchange and an incredible medicine that we practice. And the reasons are simple. The reason that the, do the doctor recommended physio is because they speak the same language. They learn from the same books, they believe the same things about the body, about how it works, about how it heals, and they trust each other. They're in the same system. And the reason the doctor isn't recommending me or you, unless uh, there are a few doctors, obviously, but mostly, um, is because we're talking a completely different language. And I feel that that's not necessary. I would like us all to be on the same page. And I think it's absolutely possible. So if you'd like to join me on that, that journey of making that possible, um, yeah, I'd love to have you with me. So thank you very much. So I'll, I'll just get a couple of questions if there's anything. And um, yeah. Um, that's really interesting. Um, I read an article sometime back and it reported that the acupuncture meridians flow through the fascia, the left yes. of the okay. tissue just beneath the skin, and that parts then split off to connect with the organs. So I'm just wondering. Great question. I forgot to address that, but yeah, thanks for bringing that up. So the question was about uh, the fascia, because there is a lot of um, theorizing about the acupuncture channels being actually the fascia, or basically inter, inter, some kind of electrical activity going on at the interfaces of, of uh, tissues, and that that's where the information is, is flowing. And I went, I did go down the route of fascia and I went down the route of interfaces and like all kinds of, I went down and uh, Helene Langevin and her team have done beautiful research, really beautiful research, um, looking at uh, trying to find the channels that way, but I don't think they have found the channels. 
um, and the people who are in this camp um, also don't think that the fascia ha has to do with it. Although now we are kind of realizing the importance of fascia and, um, and needling can have an effect, a release effect on fascia, totally. Um, I don't think that when we needle a point and you get a big nerve sensation, the fascia are not um, so important. Yeah, short answer. Um, I have already started um, trying to, it's, it's, it's my thing to, because I've, I've worked in the medical system, to try and translate what, what I've done in the last few years into um, mo modern language, as in people that the people are familiar with. Yeah, just for anyone who, who couldn't hear, it's a medical professional who's gone into acupuncture practice. And uh, yeah, I, I do find a lot of, um, Nurses come to me, doctors, medical professionals, um, and they love the approach that I use, where I am talking about exactly how it works, and they just love that, you know, to get a, to get something to, for me to speak in a language that matches up with what they already know, because they feel the, the effect of acupuncture, they know it's good, they know it's real, um, and to hear that it, it does actually link up with what they already know to be established uh, physiology is just they love it. yeah 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 and and I, I want to go further like as you were talking about the patterns there and how it's difficult to grasp the patterns and I would say uh, the the Chinese view of looking at the body um, and the interrelationship between the organs we have begun to do that here with systems biology we have begun mm -hmm. and there are direct correlations between the observations made by the Chinese and their dissections and um, the way that they dissected like the, the questions they were asking were just different to the questions that we've asked um, and there, there are direct correlations in systems biology. Systems biology is looking at like how the hypothalamus releases um, hormones and affects the adrenals and uh, different parts of the, how, how everything fits together. Basically like the acupuncture patterns, that is systems biology, um, but the, the Chinese are way ahead uh, with systems biology. I think, I wish, I wish Western researchers would learn the Chinese patterns and start looking for, for how it connects together with the physiology because they really, there's so much that they had absolutely nailed. Um, like, for instance, I remember I was in China and um, uh, the doctor said the patient had a dry mouth and she said dry mouth is caused by uh, spleen chi deficiency or pancreas, you know, pancreas chi deficiency. And I thought, why, why would that be? Like, why would a dry mouth be caused by sort of a problem with the pancreas? Anyone know? What do you know? Was it insulin, um, I suppose, the first time? Not insulin. This is the thing. What I found out when I studied enzymes. biology then. Enzymes. enzymes. Okay, enzymes. Yeah. So what makes your mouth wet? Enzymes. S saliva. Yeah. Where does saliva come from? The salivary glands? Where does the saliva come before it gets to the salivary glands? The pancreas. The pancreas pumps a couple of litres of saliva up to the mouth every day. How did they know that? Because it produces a chemical. Yeah because they did dissections and they followed the, the vessels that go up to the mouth. They found it. They found it because they looked, which is a favorite phrase in biology. You don't know unless you look. Well, they looked, they really did. And they, they put together so many things that we just still haven't put together. No one in this room could answer that question, even you and you're a medical professional. Yeah, amazing. Anyone else? Uh, no, no, another excellent lecture, and thank you very much Thanks for so that. Much. But I'm just sort of thinking our language changes its meaning over, even within the last couple of generations, certain words don't mean the same that they used to meant. Yeah. So just imagine going back to ancient China, for that medieval period in China, or the medieval period in Ireland. People look for reference points from around what they 
they saw in nature to try to make sense of observations that they found. You know, and I know my own practice personally when it comes to say liberty, stagnation, and all of that. I don't use the word angry anymore and anger because over the last hundred years I think the use of that word has changed from mm -hmm. into a very narrow focus. He's an angry person. So I'm inclined to use the word entrapment and I think it resonates much more. So I think we have to kind of, as you're doing, move with the times and try to give sort of explanation. And again, the number of people, for example, in acupuncture that might read, say, one of the books by the greats like Giovanni or whatever, and come to the conclusion that teeth marks on the side of the tongue automatically mean that the person might be spleen gene deficient, as if there's a magical connection, <laughs> as opposed to a physiological connection, that the spleen is a transforming fluid and the tongue is too big for your mouth and the teeth crushed down on it. And when you explain it in those terms, it becomes much, much simpler mm. and more sort of up-to-date, if you like, and there's greater buy-in from people that might be sitting on the yes. fence. Yes. And the fence is a very crowded place. As <laughs> yes. sit and wait. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to pass you over to uh, Keith. Hi, yeah. I'm Karen. Do you have any opinions to the for some of the course you're working on? Yeah, uh, so I have uh, a third part of the course, um, and that's on the mechanisms, and that's the really super exciting part. Um, that it's, it's just so fascinating uh, but it's based on a paper that I have written that is now in peer review so when it's published then I can I can get going on it um, but yeah it's pretty much done <laughs> it's coming <laughs> yeah thank you yeah thanks, thanks.